Hey, what you reading for? Hello and welcome to my YouTube channel where I talk about books, literary, horror, classics, and contemporary. Today, my top 10 favorite horror books from the 1980s. Now, there is a chance, a very good chance, that your favorite horror book from the 1980s did not make it onto my list. And you may be tempted to get on the comment section and tell me how wrong I am, right? Please, 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 please do not resist that temptation. If you disagree with me or if you feel like I have forgotten an obvious book, uh, get on that comment section and let me hear about it. I always enjoy connecting with viewers in the comment section and uh, that's where I get a lot of uh, great recommendations as well. And I want my opinions and ideas to be challenged. I think that's one of the best things about this platform. If you are new here, thank you for stopping by. I hope you consider subscribing. The growth is what keeps this channel going and I uh, and it is greatly appreciated. So please uh, help the algorithm, hit that like button. I am going to roll a short intro sequence and I'll see you on the other side for my top 10 favorite horror books from the 1980s. <laughs> Kicking off the list at number 10 is Brainchild by Andrew Niederman. Now this is probably the tamest book on the list. Uh, it is dark uh, and it is structured like a horror novel, but there isn't much blood, if any. And there's not much in the way of physical violence, preferring instead a psychological violence. Lois is 16 years old. She is the smartest person in her school, including the teachers. And it's tough being the smartest one around. I mean, she feels like she's surrounded by idiots, because she probably is. Uh, she's a bit socially awkward. She isn't into the stupid things the other kids are interested in, like clothes and boys and that nonsense, right? What she is into is science, more specifically, behavioral science. So she has a little lab set up at home with animals that she observes and tracks their behavior, right? And one day, Lois's mother is so frustrated with her because she wants her daughter to be like the other kids, right? Or like she was at her age, into boys and clothes and making friends, that sort of thing. So she tears down her lab and gets rid of all the lab animals. Now, uh, Lois takes this in stride uh, she's not that upset about losing her uh, lab animals because she has um, better test subjects uh, in mind, her family. So she goes to work setting up uh, her new lab with uh, new experiments, right? Now, Brainchild is a disturbing book, but in a fun way. Uh, it's tightly paced with, I think, just the right touch of camp to make it even that more fun. And it comes in at number 10. At number nine, Blood Music by Greg Bear. Now, Greg, uh, Blood Music is a great horror sci-fi hybrid. In the first half of the book, we have a biotechnologist who goes rogue, right? He creates a, <laughs> he creates a cell that is intelligent and that uh, can mutate. And he fears that the lab he works for is going to discover his unique uh, creation and that they will destroy it. So what he does is he decides he's going to smuggle the cells out of the lab. And he does so by hiding them in his own body. Seems like a terrible idea, right? <laughs> so what he does is he smuggles the cells out of the lab by hiding them in his own body. Which seems like a terrible idea, but... Biotechnologists are going to biotechnologize, isn't it? Don't hate the player, hate the game. So in the first half of the book, we have a very cool body horror, and then a global pandemic, the spreading of an intelligent virus kind of horror. And then the second half of the book, we get a beautiful and interesting sci-fi experience as the cells start to communicate with their hosts and they undergo the 
They undertake the complete transformation of the world. It's not a big book, uh, about 340 pages, but it's almost like two books in one. And they were both thoroughly interesting and enjoyable for me. Oh, good times with blood music. At number eight, The Ceremonies by T.E.D. Klein, a religious cult, an ancient beast, an ex-nun looking to lose her virginity, and a little old man hell-bent on bringing about the end of the world. So there's a lot to like in The Ceremonies. The setting goes back and forth between New York City, including the Upper West Side and Coney Island, and a rural community of religious fundamentalists, uh, not unlike the Amish. And the lore in this book is very cool, I think, very inventive. The earth is a sort of, sort of an egg that when the conditions are just right and when the ceremonies are performed exactly as they should be, the earth will crack open and hatch this lizard insect hybrid that will rule its subjects. The Ceremonies is a fun example of rural horror with um, elements of the big city sprinkled in for a nice change of pace. It does a good job combining the supernatural with a sort of serial killer-like character and it also has elements of a creature feature. So there's a lot to like here and it makes my list coming in at number eight. At number seven, Dearest by Peter Luran. Dearest gives us the first person narration of an English taxi driver with serious issues. He hates women, so the misogyny in this book is cranked up to 11. Now, I hate misogyny, but here in this book, it's so over the top that it's, it's parody. And there is nothing funny about misogyny, but there is something funny about an idiot with unwarranted and unabashed confidence in what he believes in and what he's doing. And this protagonist is an idiot. But he has it all figured out and he wants to tell us about it. And it's hilarious. He killed his wife. And now he is doing, uh, let's say, unconventional things with her corpse. But he tells us the story and he gives us his rationale. And he does these fantastical um, mental gymnastics in order to justify himself to us. I thought it was laugh out loud funny, which is probably not something I should admit to publicly, but uh, you know, that's never stopped me before. In real life, I would not want to be anywhere near this nut job, but in a work of fiction, I thoroughly enjoy following his story. And if you have a dark sense of humor, there's a good chance you would like it too. At number six, The Drive-In by Joe R. Lansdale. A group of friends go to a massive six screen drive-in complex in Texas. A, supernat a supernatural event occurs, which traps the thousand or so moviegoers in this drive-in. So we get a survival tale, we get the collapse of society with aliens and monsters and cannibalism. It's like Lord of the Flies meets Lovecraft with hor low-budget horror movies playing in a loop in the background. The drive-in uh, was a huge hit for Joe R. Lansdale. Uh, it is the first in a trilogy, but it, it also works perfectly well as a standalone. I have not read the other two installments, but I will surely do so in the near future. I had a good time at the drive-in, and I'm looking forward to going back. At number five, The Great and Secret Show by Clive Barker. Clive Barker is the best thing to happen to horror in the 1980s. And with The Great and Secret Show, he gives us a horror fantasy action hybrid. It's the first book of a two-part trilogy, or the unfinished trilogy, if you will. But again, it also works perfectly well as a standalone. There is a magic called the art and uh, some bad people are willing to do anything to get their hands on it. And some good people who uh, know what would happen if they succeeded, they are willing to do anything to stop them. So we have a large cast of characters racing through New Mexico and California 
and they conjure up entities to destroy their enemies and destroy anyone who gets in their way. We have a telepathic ape. We have murderous snakes made from a magician's excrement. We have television characters that come to life to pleasure the residents of a quiet California suburb. There's lots of weirdness in this book and lots of action. Two things Clive Barker does very well. And this is also a good example of Clive Barker's world building and character development chops, of which he has loads. Nobody does world building better than Clive Barker, I think. Now, I have not read every author, of course, but in my experience as a reader, nobody does world building better than uh, Clive Barker. And in addition to spectacular world building and inventive lore, he gives us the weird, the dark, the erotic. So it's hard to go wrong uh, when you pick up a Clive Barker book. Coming in at number four, Fever Dream by George R. R. Martin. 19th century vampire steamboat racing on the Mississippi River. Fever Dream is an excellent example of historical fiction horror. We spent a lot of time in New Orleans, which is a fun place to visit. And we spent a lot of time uh, on steamboats on the Mississippi. The writing is excellent. George R.R. R. Martin does a great job placing the reader in the time and in the location of the story. Uh, I found it to be quite an immersive experience. Not really scary, though, but you know, like when are vampires ever scary, right? Never. But vampires are probably too silly to be scary, but they're fun, or they can be fun. And here in this book, there are good vampires and bad, bad vampires, and they fight one another with non-vampires getting caught in the middle. It's good fun. You come for the blood sucking and you'll stay for the steamboat racing. At number three, The Damn Nation Game by Clive Barker. This was Clive Barker's first novel, coming off the mega success of his short story collections, The Books of Blood. In The Damn Nation Game, a man makes a deal with a Foscian figure. figure. Decades later, uh, the man he doesn't want to pay up, so the Faustian figure comes after him. So the man hires a, an ex-convict, um, former boxer. He hires him to be his bodyguard to protect him. This book has an amazing opening set in Warsaw, Poland, right at the end of World War II, when uh, amid the rubble and the destruction of the war, uh, soldiers and civilians alike they are experiencing a, an adrenaline withdrawal. So they flock to this uh, destroyed city and where they uh, engage in games of chance. The more morbid and the more bizarre, the better. The Damnation game is a bit of an action horror hybrid and it features horrible people doing horrible things and uh, not so horrible people trying to do the right thing. But it's not easy to do the right thing, especially with all the killing going on around you. At number two on my list of top 10 best horror books from the 1980s, Disturb Not the Dream by Paula Trackman. This book is insane. This book uh, needs help from a licensed medical professional. Now, this book came out in 1981, and here's what I believe happened. I, I don't have any evidence for this, but I'm pretty sure it went down like this. In 1979, so two years before this book was put out, uh, V.C. Andrews hit the scene with uh, Flowers in the Attic, which was a young adult book about two siblings who are trapped in an attic, and they have an incestuous relationship and this book was a huge hit uh, especially with um, young readers right now Paula Trackman she was not a writer at least not a published writer she uh, in fact disturbed not the dream would be the only work of fiction she would put out uh, she was not a writer she was an eighth grade teacher so 
One day, she's at work at this junior high school she works at. And all the kids keep talking about flowers in the attic. Oh my God, have you read Flowers in the Attic? Oh, you totally must read this book. It's so amazing. It's bonkers, right? So she can't get any of her students to concentrate on the lesson because all they want to do is talk about this book. So she's thinking, what's all the fuss about? What's all this flowers in the attic that I keep hearing about? So she confiscates a uh, copy from Amy Wendelmeyer, who is usually a very well-behaved student, but on that day, like she has a copy of Flowers in the Attic, like hidden inside uh, her history book. And George Washington is trying to cross the Potomac or the Delaware or whatever river George Washington crossed. And, um, and uh, Amy Wendelmeyer, she's like giggling and gasping. And uh, so Paula Trackman, she confiscates the book, right? And later that night, uh, she reads it. She reads Flowers in the Attic. And she's thinking, what is all the fuss about? And it's selling how many copies? So the next day she goes back to work, back to the high school, right? And she goes to the chemistry teacher, Mr. Wilbon, uh, Rick, or Chef Rick, as uh, some of the faculty members call him. And she says to him, she says, Rick, cook me up a batch of your famous Pac-Man tablets. I'm going to write a book. So he does, because Rick is always happy to oblige, you know? So Paula Trackman, uh, Later that night, she gets onto her typewriter and uh, and she's not used to taking psychedelics, so she just munches down on the on the whole tablet like it's a candy bar, right? And she doesn't sleep for a week. She just and she forgets to go to school. Or she forgets to go to work. She just types and 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 types, and types, and types until bam, voila, we have disturb not the dream. And the publisher she sends it to, the publisher's looking at this manuscript and going, what? is this madness. This is Victorian style erotica with children being slaughtered and decapitations and infidelity and incest. We'll sell millions. Uh, and they did, and they did. And uh, they all lived happily ever after. I think that's what happened with this book. Uh, it's too bad she never wrote another book after this because she is a really talented writer. But I guess coming down from all those tablets was a uh, rough ride. She did not want to get back on. So she went back to teaching. She gave us one book, but it is an excellent book. Trigger Warnings for Everything, by the way. Now, as a, as a reader, I can be easily triggered. Uh, but the writing is so good that I, I just went with it. And I'm very glad that I did. Which means that coming in at number one as the best horror book to come out of the 80s is The Hellbound Heart by Clive Barker. This was a modest hit for Clive Barker. Um, so he left England and he went to Hollywood and he himself turned this book into a movie he directed called Hellraiser, which over 30 years later is still spawning sequels and remakes and reboots. In the hellbound heart, a hedonistic criminal, Frank, he gets hold of a mysterious puzzle box which supposedly can summon otherworldly pleasures. And it turns out it can. However, uh, in this other world, they don't uh, quite distinguish pleasure from pain. So Frank has all his skin ripped off and he is sent to the underworld to be tortured. Win some, lose some. Isn't it? However, his brother's wife, Julia, with whom he'd been having an affair, she decides she's going to bring him back. And to do this, she um, lures men back to her home and uh, kills them and gives uh, their blood to Frank. Now, the otherworldly creatures known as Cenobites who had been torturing Frank, they are not happy with uh, losing him. So they come into this world to take him back. The Hellbound Heart is horrible people doing horrible things. And there's lots of blood and sex and a confusion of pleasure and pain. But as for the reading experience, no confusion, pure pleasure. 
and it is, in my opinion, the best horror book to come out of the 1980s. So what do you think of my top 10? Do you have any experience with uh, any of the books or authors I talk about in this video? Did I forget to include a book that I definitely should have included? I look forward to connecting with you and hearing your reactions and, and, uh, and opinions in the comments section. Uh, don't forget to like and subscribe. Thank you for watching. I'll see you at the next video.